And now to our first keynote speaker. She's someone with many years of experience in health policy, both in her own country and internationally. In recent years, she's become known for a relentless pursuit of antimicrobial resistance and the search for a new generation of antibiotics. She has played a key role in making that an urgent international priority. Please welcome the Chief Medical Officer for England, Dame Sally Davis. Your Highness, the Lord Darcy of Denham, Your Excellencies and colleagues, I am indeed honoured to speak to you today. Actually, I've got a bit of trepidation if the truth were told. It's a very important audience with more than 100 countries here. And as Lord Darcy said, the problem of infections is getting ever worse and of superbugs yet worse. So actually, I've come to ask for the help of all of you. I want to talk about antimicrobial resistance, drug-resistant infections. I want to talk to you about the people it affects in hospitals, in communities, the damage in terms of disability and deaths that it causes, and actually what each of us in this room can do to stop this, to stop the damage, the hurt, the pain, the deaths, and their faceless deaths. It's very difficult when I talk about this. People say, but I don't know anyone who's had this. And I say, oh, yes, you do. But you didn't know that it was a drug-resistant infection that caused that damage. So let me start with one of my patients. This is a young man, Tony. And those of you who know me well will see that the eyes are a bit yellow because he was one of my Caribbean patients in London who instead of having nice round red blood cells like most of us in this room, had sickle cells, these distorted red blood cells. And it'll be no surprise to any of you that these distorted stiff red blood cells block blood vessels so oxygen doesn't get through, you damage tissues. I should say there's quite a lot of sickle cell disease here in the Gulf as well. Now, the problem for Tony was that instead of having nice rounded top to his thigh bone, the femur, in here in his hip, it was damaged by that sickle cell. So he had this, what I would call, crumbly hip. Just imagine living with that. Those of you who've had arthritis in your hips know it can be painful. This is worse. This hurts with every movement. Lying in bed at peace. It is like having a cheese grater in your hip. So what do you do? Well, you replace the hip. But that was the beginning of his real problems. Because about a week after the hip replacement, Tony said to me, you know, Doc, this is great. I'm free of pain the first time for ages. And then five days later, he said, you know, Doc, I've got the pain back. And his temperature started to rise. And he had that superbug MRSA that had got into his blood at the time of operation, then got into his hip and was damaging his hip and giving that pain. Well, of course, everything went into overdrive. He was given intravenous antibiotics for weeks at high dose. They didn't work. And then they opened him up and they put in some antibiotic beads into that hip. That didn't work. So after three months, the orthopedic surgeon said, we can't win. And they took that hip out. Imagine then, Tony, age 22, walking 
on crutches with no hip, swinging his leg around. My skirt doesn't work for that. He was known as Mr. Jelly, Mr. Jelly Leg, because he didn't have a hip. We'd kept it out for a year, put in a new hip on the scrupulous antiseptic um, conditions, and he did very well. But while Tony's story ends happily, that isn't the case for everyone who gets a drug-resistant infection. So take the 60,000 newborn babies every year in India who die of drug-resistant infections. This is a tragedy. This should not be allowed to happen. And two years ago, our then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Cameron, at my request, commissioned Lord O'Neill to do an independent review of antimicrobial resistance. Now, Jim, when I said to him, please will you come and meet the Prime Minister because he wants you to do this independent review, said, what's AMR? Why would I do it? And the reason we wanted this project was because we needed an economist to look at this. Doctors were not being heard. Nurses were not being heard. Patients didn't know they had the problem. And yet, as Jim's modeling showed, already we are seeing 700,000 deaths a year across the world of drug-resistant infections. Importantly, they went on having modeled that and shown that this will impact most on the developing world because this is the story of malaria. This is the story of TB. This is the story of HIV. 7% of HIV viruses are resistant to first-line drugs. This is the story of bacteria. And so he did the modeling with his team of what would happen if we didn't take action. And what he showed was that if we take no action, by 2050, the deaths will be greater than those at the moment of cancer across the world, 10 million deaths a year. So this matters. Now, there were a lot of naysayers who said, no, no, they've overdone it, and at least one of them's in the audience. But, I heard him laugh, on September the 21st, the World Bank produced a report which actually echoed Jim O'Neill's report, showing if we don't sort this, a lot of people will be pushed into poverty. And actually, the work of Jim O'Neill shows that this could cost the equivalent of losing the UK GDP to the world every year, each and every year. So this matters. It matters because of deaths, suffering, disfigurement, and the economy of individuals, their families, communities, and their countries. And if we don't get it right, we're going to have a story like this one where a child in the 1940s had bitten inside her mouth. She developed a high temperature. Her face was so swollen she could hardly breathe. That was six days after biting her mouth. Now, she was very lucky. She was living near the Mayo Clinic in the 40s when they were experimenting with penicillin and she was successfully treated because of that experiment. But if we do not take action, we risk moving back to this pre-antibiotic era when people cannot be treated for cuts and grazes that then go on to infect them. So I want to show you first why this happens. And the way I'm going to do this is by showing you an absolutely beautiful video done by colleagues at Harvard who've given me it to use. And it demonstrates the power of nature and genetic evolution. 
Because I'm sure all of you know that resistance occurs when random mutations happen in the genes or the DNA of the microbe, whether we're talking about a virus, a bacteria, TB, a fungus, it happens randomly. But because that mutation gives the bug an opportunity to survive when the treatment, the antibiotic or antimicrobial, is there, it has a survival advantage. You could call this Darwinism at work. So they built a large Petri dish with some channels in it. And the Petri dish contains what I would call agar as a doctor, but it's actually just meat jelly, which has different concentrations of antibiotic. And in the outside channel, there is only the meat jelly. In the next channel, and you can see here the bacteria growing, there's a normal amount of antibiotic that you get in the bloodstream. See that slowly the bacteria are beginning to grow. That's normal levels of antibiotic. The next channel that in time it'll break through to has 10 times the normal level of antibiotic, and it's just getting into that area. So these are spontaneous mutations. At the end, we'll show you the tree. And now it's broken through into a 100 times concentration of the antibiotic. And the central um, column of agar, which it's just going into, is a 1,000 times as much antibiotic as a normal E. coli could survive in. I think that's beautiful, but look at the mutation trees and you can see the evolution tree of those random mutations that gave that opportunity for growth. So now you've seen it, I'm sure you're going to join me in agreeing we have to take action. We have to do this globally. And this started, this action, some time ago. It goes back to a resolution in 1998 at the World Health Assembly. But you know what we're all really good at. We're good at saying we must do something. Much less good at doing it. Making something happen. So, again, before my time, there was a discussion of a strategy at the World Health Organization. Again, we must do it. Again, nothing happened. So when I realized in my role as chief medical officer through an independent annual report that we had to really do something, I said, let's start with a WHO resolution. I have to say the cognoscenti laughed at me. They said, why? We've had two, and it made no difference. And I thought, OK, but where else can we start? Here, your highness has brought together over 100 countries. We can start here. But as well, in WHO, there's 193 countries. It's an even greater spread. We have to understand that none of us is safe from this. People travel with drug-resistant infections. They may travel with it, obviously, because they're ill. They may travel with it quietly, unknowingly, in their guts. And I can tell you horrific stories of health tourism, where people have gone from one country sick to another, traveling, taking dreadful drug resistance. It's a resistance we don't normally see in our country, admitted with patients with burns from other countries, patients in India from other countries. And overuse of antibiotics drives these drug-resistant infection mutations happening. So we decided, as a nation, 
that in 2014, we would go for a World Health Assembly resolution, but it had to have teeth and make a difference. And I want at this point to thank all of your excellencies, because we wouldn't be making a difference if it wasn't for you and your colleagues. You've stood up, you've been brave, you've been counted, you've voted, and you're beginning to take action. Today, I'm gonna to plead with you to take even more action and to be leaders across the world. But in 2014, we started to make a difference because the WHO set up an advisory committee, which I'm honored to chair, and we supported the WHO in producing a global action plan that then was passed by the 195 countries at the next World Health Assembly. I was told that wasn't doable in a year, but with all your support, of course it's doable. We can change the world when we need to, when we choose to, and this is an active choice that we cannot not do. The Global Action Plan was then supported, thanks to our colleagues in agricultural ministries at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN and at the Organization for Animal Health, which is um, in Paris. We then involved the G7, the G20. And let me tell you, it's because we have to look after the antibiotics we have, but we, haven't, we have an empty pipeline. We haven't got new antibiotics coming because there's a market failure. So one of the big pieces of work is economic. How do you break that market failure and move it forward? And then this year, supported by WHO, FAO, and OIE, we, the member states, went to the UN General Assembly, as Lord Darcy said, and 193 countries signed up in that Heads of State week to really make a difference, to do something about it, and asked the Secretary General to report back in 2018 on what needed doing. Now, the action plan is based on strategic and objectives of improving awareness and education, strengthening our knowledge and evidence through research and surveillance, infection prevention and control, basic sanitation and hygiene. They're all terribly obvious things we need to do. It won't just improve this, it'll prevent infections, it'll help patient safety. Optimizing the use of antimicrobial medicines and then this market failure issue. And this global action plan calls on all member states to put in place national action plans within two years. That means by next May. We've built in a flexible approach to monitoring and reporting because every country starts from a different position. And we want everyone to work on a One Health way. So what do I mean by One Health? Well, you know, this isn't just about human health. This is terribly complicated. It's about fish, free swimming in the oceans and rivers, but fish farming and the runoff from that into sewage. It's about agriculture for fruit and vegetables. It, antibiotics leach into our environment and wildlife. It's about pets, always called companion animals for reasons I don't get. But actually, it's about how Intensive farming often uses antibiotics for growth promotion because it's cheaper than hygiene and sanitation. And the complexity gets ever bigger. That, ladies and gentlemen, is One Health. It's complex. So we persuaded our government that it wasn't fair to expect countries to do this without support. I was given 265 million of official development aid to set up the Fleming Fund to help low-income and middle-income countries develop their laboratory capacity and capability. And I'm delighted to see the minister from Vietnam as our pilot project is in Vietnam. And we're working through the WHO, FAO, OIE to help countries develop their national um, action plan because we have 
to remember that if we start by preventing infection, we're doing better. Many of you will be more expert on how to prevent malaria than me, but clearly, sanitation, hygiene, and then things like patient safety and preventing surgical site infections and the new guidelines just put out about those, let alone vaccination, which is terribly important. Do you know that pneumococcal vaccination has been shown to reduce the use of antibiotics? Flu vaccination does because people don't get superimposed bacterial pneumonias. So there's a terrific amount of work we all need to do to prevent infection. But, and important for this meeting, is the fact that we need innovation at every level. We need innovation to ensure that we don't use too many antibiotics when they're not needed. We need appropriate use, and that's a behavioral issue. But also, let me put on record, more people die in poor countries because they don't get access to antibiotics than do get them. How do we get this balance right? There's the counterfeit and falsified ones. How do we reduce patient demand? We've been trying incentivization, both behavioral and financial in Britain, with great success. And I was delighted at the UN General Assembly when the Director General of the FAO said we must phase out the use of animal growth promotion use. We need new drugs. We don't have rapid diagnostics. We need new vaccines. And then we've got to solve the problems of universal health care. We've got to find better ways of implementing what we know, of delivering what we know. And as I've stressed, we've got to remember the One Health issues, and that's why we went to Unger, the heads of state, because this isn't about health or agriculture, it's about everyone and the impact on the economy. And actually, how they are misused antibiotics across the world and the impact they're having on our environment through runoff from factories, through runoff from high use farms or high use hospitals. And some people in the animal world will tell you it doesn't matter. But look at these. They're curves. And what you see in the green line is resistant salmonella in retail chickens, and the red line, resistant salmonella in humans. When in Canada, kefioto, um, a kephlosporin, was being injected into eggs to hatch them, as soon as the first vertical line they were voluntarily stopped, the resistant bacteria began to fall. They crept back into use, so they had to put in place a proper ban. And you know, we can do this. These are two um, curves from Britain. The top one is Clostridium difficile in hospitals. That needed changed prescribing. Look how we were able to produce it. The bottom one's MRSA. It needed scrupulous hygiene and hand washing. All of this is patient safety under another name. It works, and we've got to be obsessional, and we've got to keep teaching people. We can also do it in animals. Here is data published 10 days ago from Britain, and what you don't need to read it, because if you look, what it shows you is we've managed over the last year to reduce antibiotic use down significantly, whether it is the total, the fluoroquinolones, or the kephlosporins, and colistin is hardly used at all. And then if you look at the different animal groups, you can see that we've had a particular impact in pigs and poultry, but it is across all the animals. So why is it working? Well, we're educating the sector, We've got public pull-through, but that awareness and data transparency play a big role. And public pull-through is really interesting. If you go to the States now, what you see more and more is fast food outlets, Shake Shack, some of the others saying antibiotic-free chickens. It's a sales promotion pitch. So the public are beginning to say what needs doing. So. What am I asking all of you to do? 
I'm talking to ministers, but colleagues, it's all of us. We need to get our infection prevention and control right. We need to know our problem, that's diagnostics and surveillance. We must ensure proper access, but reduce excess. That all needs awareness and education. And of course, we're going to have to evaluate, learn, innovate across the whole of the human and agriculture sector. And this is really difficult. The issues of AMR are most profoundly seen in health, but the solution is cross-sectoral and cross-government. But, do you know, if we can start to do this in the UK, then everyone can make a start. And if we do it block by block, we can improve the outcomes for patients, their safety. We can reduce deaths. And economically, it's absolutely worth it, as I told you. So, let me also just add that in our country, where we've reduced prescribing, the savings on buying those antibiotics has more than paid for the education and data collection that we put in place at the same time. So what I'm asking is that together, we, your excellencies, professionals, colleagues, work in our own fields, work together to make this a better and safer world. Thank you. Dame Sally Davies, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to say that Dame Sally will be part of the panel discussion on infectious diseases that will take place in here tomorrow morning. Your Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning of the far-reaching conversations that we'll all have over the next two days, when WISH will build on its reputation for evidence-based conclusions. It's already enriched knowledge and understanding in so many different areas, and asked searching questions about the way healthcare is taught, organized, and funded. Today, the first panel discussions will begin at 11 a.m. You'll be able to choose between autism, which will take place in here, or health professional education or precision medicine. And then the second set of panels will be after lunch at 2 p.m. And your choice then is between accountable care, behavioral insights, and genomics in the Gulf region and Islamic ethics. And please don't miss the innovation showcases, the exhibition of 20 groundbreaking initiatives. Some of them, I promise, will really surprise you. There's even one involving rats that can detect TB. You'll be able to see all of them in the gallery for the duration of WISH. And now it only remains for me to wish you an excellent two days. Thank you.